Hey, it's a pleasure to be back in Yerevan. This is my third trip. Um, I've been working with Armenian companies now for six or seven years, and it's one of the, one of the, the my favorite things uh, is, is, is interacting with people here. Um, the community here was really smart. Some of the technology I've seen is world class. I'll be referring to some of that this afternoon. Um, and uh, this is my second lecture at AUA, and I'm glad they were willing to have me back. Uh, that is not always the case. So, uh, we're going to talk about the, the frontier of AI. There is some amazing work, very far out, not yet ready for prime time. Just to give you a sense, Zuolingua at the top there is a company that's trying to do English to animal translation. So you understand what your dog or cat is doing. Uh, the bees, Russia, Russia is experimenting uh, with uh, a whole herd of, or, or a swarm of mechanical bees to help solve the bee pollination problem. At the bottom left, those are two news newscasters in China who become standard uh, newscasters. They are both completely fake. Uh, they are bots, but they look and behave and sound like real people, and uh, they're among the more popular newscasters in China. An AI-created painting was just sold for over $400,000 uh, uh, in, uh, in New York recently. Next to that painting is an entirely artificial, freestanding, moving painter uh, named uh, Adia, uh, who has been, you, you give her a suggestion, what kind of painting you like, and she creates something brand new and original, real brush strokes, moves around, can talk. So this is, these are some of the far out things going on in AI right now. If you look at what's happened to AI uh, since 2011, 2012, Stanford University combines venture funding, publications, patents, student enrollments in AI around the United States, and uh, the amount of activity in AI has gone up sevenfold in the past five years. It's, it's, it's really, uh, if software is eating the world, AI is eating software. So we're going to talk about the big picture about deep learning, look at what, what some of the trends are that people have been investing in and companies have been founded around, and then spend a little bit of time backing up and saying, what are some of the benefits, what are some of the risks? So what we mean by artificial intelligence uh, is software that performs at the level of a human being. And it comprises a whole bunch of different disciplines. The most important right now, where all the money is going, is machine learning and deep learning but it also includes natural language processing, computer vision, um, autonomous cars, but where the most of the money is going is in machine learning. But this is not new. We've been experimenting with artificial intelligence now since the 1940s. Back then it was called cybernetics, and you, how many people have heard of Alan Turing? Good. Alan Turing was a British scientist who created what's called Turing, the Turing test. Basically say, if you cannot tell whether a machine is a human being or a machine, um, we, have, we, have, we have passed the Turing test and AI is becoming um, normal. And I'm going to read that, uh, won many prizes for that. Uh, in the uh, 1950s, the first two paradigms of AI, the two ways of thinking about AI, both became popular. One is rule-based computing, if-then logic, if the patient has, uh, has a certain uh, a blood pressure rate, if the patient is exhibiting other symptoms, then we can say this patient probably has hypertension. That is one main thread of AI called rule-based computing. The second is uh, basically neural networks where the attempt is to, mod to model AI on the behavior of the human brain. Thousands to millions of small interactions creating a, 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 a logic that is not necessarily perceivable to us, but it is perceivable at the level of machine learning. Both this activity became very popular in the 1950s. The 1960s and 70s was the age of expert systems, those rule-based systems that were used in medical diagnostics. 1982, neural computing became important again. And for us today, um, the date to remember is 2006, because in 2006, a uh, Canadian scientist named Jeff Hinton, who has spent half his time at Google, like everybody else in AI, uh, radically improved the accuracy of neural nets. And we'll talk about what he did in a few minutes. 
but his students in 2012 won an image classification competition called ImageNet with a radically better ability to classify images automatically using things like NVIDIA graphics processing units. That shocked the industry, and suddenly deep learning, neural computing had won. Today, we're in the age of applied deep learning. We are here, uh, where deep learning has now become the standard, and it's being used in medicine, in automotive computing, in retail, in manufacturing. These have now become mainstream AI. Uh, one more thing to remember is that in the race to deploy AI uh, in real situations, China has a tremendous advantage over all of us. Population, big data, number of companies. So 70 cents of every dollar spent worldwide on artificial intelligence is being spent in China, just to keep that in mind. If you look um, at, at, at patents and publications, uh, the explosion of patents and publications about AI started in 2012, but that was the takeoff. And if you look at the complete difference between machine learning, deep learning, neural nets um, as a force, you can see that they are dominating uh, the world of AI compared to logic programming, which is basically rule-based systems. At the same time, AI is always about to change humanity. We're always about to usher in a grand age of where AI is going to solve all of our problems. Back in 1958, the two leading scientists, Simon and Newell, said, within 10 years, digital computing will be the world's chess champion. Or, we're going to have a fully intelligent machine within a decade. So we've been making ridiculously outlandish predictions about AI uh, for uh, as long as I've been alive. Most recently, uh, one of the senior scientists at Google, Andrew Ng, said, AI is new electricity. And uh, Sundar Pekai, uh, 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 who, who runs major companies said AI is more profound than electricity and fire. So we're still in the era of AI hype. We've had cycles of AI, um, and a new theory will spark a tremendous wave of interest in AI. Uh, compute power will catch up, investors will invest, will harvest the results, <laughs> and then we'll step back and say, you know, the results weren't nearly as good as what we were promised and we'll enter a period called AI winter, where funding stops, research stops, companies say, no, I don't want to do any more AI for a while. And then a new theory will come around and, and, and spark things. So right now, this deep learning stuff, of where Jeff Hinton uh, in 2006 uh, led some pretty profound improvements in deep learning, that's the current generation we're in. So the question is, have we escaped? Have we reached escape velocity? No more AI winters, or are we going to see another one? Because this has always hurt practitioners as well as investors when AI winter hits. In terms of money, deep learning is the fastest growing. It's the dominant two-thirds of money spent on AI are being spent on neural network computing, and I will explain what that is in a few minutes. In terms of where the money is going, in terms of business, uh, it's healthcare, it's sales and marketing, to some degree, it's automotive, autonomous cars, um, but healthcare and sales are the two dominant places where AI money is actually being spent on business solutions. We're in a maturing market. AI is no longer new. It's no longer the cool thing. And so we are spending more money um, in terms of investment going uh, to established companies already in the market. Uh, we're spending around $20 billion a year uh, on AI investing, and as you can say, the share of, 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 of funding going to established companies is going up and up and up. Where is the money really being spent? Who is spending most money on AI? It's not investors like me. Um, it is uh, technology giants like Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. 75% of all funding of AI work is happening in big tech companies. And this has a profound implication for startups. One of the things that's happened since 2012 is a surge in mergers and acquisitions as AI companies are being snapped up uh, by the technology giants. So if you look at who is, who is buying AI companies, it's Google, it's Apple, it's Facebook, it's Amazon, it's Intel, it's Microsoft, it's Twitter. So most acquisitions have been made by the tech giants 
who are essentially in an arms race to buy not only technology, but many of the acquisitions have been for the people. So the quality, the technical quality of people is essentially very important in building an AI company. So let's kind of take the big picture, where are we in terms of numbers? We have funded um, to the almost $50 billion of, of, of venture capital in, uh, in artificial intelligence that does not count Google, Amazon, Microsoft. We've increased funding eightfold between 2013 um, and 2018. We've doubled the number of startups, uh, and uh, this is just an extraordinary market. We've had 434 acquisitions. About 7% of all AI companies have already been acquired. And the exit values, if you do well, the median is about 200 million, and the average, including many multi-billion dollar exits, is about half, half a billion dollars. And for companies in the market, if you want to know what your company is worth, it's typically around six times your sales numbers. So takeaways, we've invested $50 billion. We have 6,500 active AI companies today. There is lots of merger and acquisition further. Further, we're probably at the top of a hype cycle where there's more excitement about AI uh, than there's ever been. And that will come down. That exit valuations are strong. There's still a lot of money to be made. But if you look at if your companies if you are expecting to be acquired or to join a bigger company, Google, Amazon, Facebook, IBM have only made many of their bets. Yes, there's still more to come, but I think the M&A market uh, is going to be transitioning, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. 32 companies in the AI world worth more than a billion dollars, and, uh, and a good percentage of those are in the healthcare space. Let's turn from the numbers to uh, trends. What do people like? And we're going to talk about six trends that are worth investing. Unsupervised deep learning, XAI. Anybody know what XAI means? Anybody heard the term? Okay, we'll be a new term. Uh, we moved from tools, AI platforms, to vertical solutions. Big market for data engineering, and there's some exciting companies right here in Yerevan in that space. And finally, insight as a service for all of you as a consulting world. So unsupervised deep learning. How does a neural network work? Well, you take things like objects, like pictures of, of animals, and human beings classify them. There, there are whole cities in Africa where the number one employment is having women in front of computers manually drawing boxes uh, around pictures on the screen and classifying them. This is a cat, this is a dog, this is a car, this is an airplane, uh, this is a gun. Uh, so you apply labels, then a neural network tries to figure out correlations. Okay, all of these images that have dogs in them, what is dogness like compared to catness? What do they have in common? And they'll create some synthetic and hypothetical variables that might be short tails things that humans didn't classify to distinguish between a dog and a cat. They will then run the model and compare the output in, in stage three with the prediction versus the reality. And this is where Jeff Hinton's magic came in because he invented something called back propagation, a fancy term for simply saying, let's feed the errors back into the model and let the model correct. Now that we know what the difference is, is this, these five images are raccoons, not cats. Let's feed that data back and improve the model. So uh, that's how AI machine learning works. And so for deploying an application, you take unlabeled data, segment four, run it through the model, and out you get output. That output can be used to classify, to tag, to organize, to predict. That's all machine learning does. There is a subset called deep learning, and that means that these models in the middle can be thousands of layers high. And people compare deep learning, the model they use is, it's like lasagna, uh, or it's like a sandwich, a multi-level sandwich, because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different variables and factors that feed upon each other. So this is what deep learning is all about, where all the excitement is. Some examples of deep learning, 
of my favorite are deep fakes. Uh, the deep fake world has really exploded. These are all these people never existed. These are all synthetically created uh, by the graphics company Nvidia. Uh, we have, last week, uh, someone unveiled technology, I think it was Google, where they can take a 40 minute clip of video and they can then create synthetic videos of those people saying things they never said. Uh, pretty scary technology. Uh, to show you this in action, let me bring up one example. I was going to show you, uh, somehow this is not working, I was going to show you a picture of the Mona Lisa and then how graphic scientists have now made the Mona Lisa move, talk, move in many directions from that one static image. Uh, and that's the power of deep fakes. So we've been talking a, a lot about neural networks and there are two flavors. And this is, this is number one investment thesis. Right now, we're in an age of supervised learning, which means human beings have to classify those objects. And if you're building an AI solution, about 90% of the cost is having human beings manually classify and tag objects. So that is supervised learning. Um, uh, you use it to build and validate networks, but you need humans in the loop. There's a new technology around unsupervised learning. It's, it's often called UML, unsupervised machine learning, where you're using statistical techniques to figure out what things have in common and to classify them without any human input. They're less accurate uh, than supervised learning, uh, but they can, uh, they can work wonders in, in narrow domains. So uh, uh, in Israel, uh, there's a company called Cortica, which is looking at one thing. How do we avoid hitting pedestrians in autonomous vehicles? And they're learning um, simply by looking at thousands of video clips which have not been categorized. A company in Germany, Vandelbots, uh, you put on a jacket that has sensors in it. And you can train a machine in 20 minutes to uh, do whatever the robot needs to do. Often pick in place in an assembly line. Happens automatically with no statistical or, or, or um, rule-based training. Dark Trace uh, and, uh, uh, is looking at how do we uh, uh, and estimate financial fraud in situations we've never seen. So the problem with supervised learning is you can only predict what you have already seen. For unsupervised learning, you can predict and evaluate things you've never seen before. So if a woman is crossing the street, drops her shopping bag, stoops in the gutter to pick up a, a loaf of bread, that has never been seen before. Uh, and an autonomous car needs to understand that. So unsupervised learning is being used to use things like that. So if you hear the term unsupervised learning, very important and extremely hot whether you want to work at the company or invest. So what's happening, what's next with deep learning? A number of companies like Google and Microsoft are releasing tools into the marketplace uh, to do automatic machine learning, to create machine learning based on providing pre-written models. Uh, the United States Defense Department wants to do lifelong learning, have AI models that continuously learn without programmer intervention. So if you hear things like lifelong learning uh, or auto ML, these are automated technologies that, re that reduce the need to build models by hand. XAI, next trend. It's all about building trust. What XAI stands for is explainable artificial intelligence. So in last year, the European Union established a law that says any time an artificial intelligence and AI touches a human, you have to explain how the AI came to its conclusion. Uh, that's now law in the European Union. Uh, it's law in New York City. Companies like MIT, uh, groups like MIT and Microsoft are trying to figure out how to make these neural models explainable. Remember, in the middle of the neural model, we don't know what's happening. We don't know which neurons are firing or why. It's very hard to understand how a neural net comes up with a conclusion. But if, you, if you're giving a patient a healthcare diagnostic that says you must go on a very strict regimen, the patient wants to know, are you sure? How did you come to that result? In the law, if you're deciding who gets parole or who has to pay a fine based on increasing use of artificial intelligence, you need to be able to explain 
uh, to that, that person what happened. If you've been denied a loan, uh, and insurance agencies right now are using AI to process loans and come up with automatic recommendations, you can get sued if you can't explain to a person why he was designed to define a loan. If the military shoots uh, a civilian town accidentally, uh, if an if, 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 if uh, autonomous car kills somebody, these are the kinds of decisions that need to be explained. So XAI is on the forefront of what's happening in AI. We need to be able to explain our models, and our models almost by definition are inexplainable. So we have to re-engineer those models. So software companies building tools to address explainability uh, are, are a, a, a hot market. One of the questions about data science is we really don't know how our models work. And some people have said data science is as much magic as it is systematic learning. Can we explain it? Do we understand how it came to its conclusions? Can two different researchers produce the same kind of results with their own data based on what a, what a, what a data science model is supposed to do? Can we understand where the data came from? How good the data is? Uh, has the data been audited? Has the data been cleaned? How do we know? And there are no data standards right now for using data in, uh, in AI. And I'm going to talk about one of the dangers uh, in healthcare in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> so, uh, being able to come up with algorithms that explain how AI works is at the forefront. Sense making. We all know that computers are great at taking a sound or an image and doing something with it. Uh, that if you hear a loud, now, a loud noise, that could be an alert. Uh, you might want to look around to see if there was an auto accident down the street. What's happening right now is taking these senses of, of vision, sound, sight, combining them, correlating them into bigger models. Uh, what does this mean in reality? What this means is situational awareness. You want to know what's happening in the world around you. You hear a sound behind you, uh, you see a bright flash. Uh, am I, uh, as, an, as an aircraft pilot, am I under attack? What's going on? So the Canadian Air Force is using this kind of sense-making technology correlating sound, sight, noise, and other kinds of vibrations to create a picture of the world and to figure out is there a day somewhere da dangerous. Uh, Marriage, the world dominant shipper, is doing the same thing at sea. What are the dangers I'm facing? Put together the picture of my ship right now, am I facing any kind of danger? Uh, this is being used in automotive computing to see what's happening inside the cabin of a car. Has the child in the front seat spilt a drink on dad who was driving? What kinds, of, what kinds of situations should autonomous car software be able to deal with? And the first thing you need to know is what is going on. So sense making, situational awareness of, is one area of growth. One of my favorites is effective computing which is to try to understand emotional content uh, by the use of sight, sound, imaging. So a company called Affectiva, which is already a unicorn, can detect uh, via vision uh, the emotional reactions of an audience to a movie or a TV show. Beyond verbal, uh, can detect uh, do you have a potential illness by the, by the tone and tenor of your voice? Is, are there vocal cues? that something might be going on. Uh, crowd emotion uses eye tracking to understand how audiences like, dislike uh, a given movie or show. And because they're so good, they can also look by gender, by age, by race. Well, uh, the 40-year-old white ladies seem to like this movie, but the 15-year-old black kids don't. So they can go with that level of discrimination. This is being used in advertising. Uh, Online emotion uh, is, uh, is using eye detection as a lie detector. And this has now been approved by the court system in Arizona. So there's lots of interesting work going on in using your emotional behavior uh, to, uh, to predict, to monitor, to manage uh, outcomes. From tools to verticals. Uh, so we have moved in AI research from focusing on fundamental platform technology. Uh, now to experimenting with, we make a difference in vertical markets. 
This has happened because we have these brilliant new graphics processors from NVIDIA. We've got big data consortiums in industry like insurance, building big data models and sharing data across companies. We have sensors that cost pennies that can be embedded in roadways, in cars, in clothing. So the sensors revolution. And then we have lots of free available machine learning frameworks that will anybody in this room to experiment with AI free versions of technology like R, like Python, uh, 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 like TensorFlow from Google. So these are now not tens of thousands of dollars, they're essentially free. Shape sensors, free software, means a whole age of experimentation. If you look at the top markets for AI, it's healthcare in terms of diagnostics, of early identification of, of potential pandemics. Uh, as is going on in Africa with, with Ebola monitoring. And a ton of work in image diagnostics, automotive, uh, autonomous cars, financial services, uh, automated financial advisory and, and services for people who never could afford a financial advisor. Now anyone can get basic financial advice, transportation, uh, uh, and technology like media. These are, the, these are the, big, the big markets right now for AI. Let's look at a few of them. The uh, first is healthcare. As, as someone will say, uh, the robot will see you now. Uh, machine learning is being used for admissions, for triaging patients as they come into the admission system, for classification of, uh, of doing genomic screening, for matching treatments uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with the automated diagnostics, for clinical trials to find the best patients, to be recruited in a clinical trial. Natural language processing is being used to alleviate one of the physician's biggest hates, which is transcribing their, their notes, their patient interview notes, automatically. Uh, this is being used for clinical documentation, for coding of records. There are over 100 companies providing some kind of blockchain for healthcare to secure healthcare records. Predictive analytics to figure out what patients provide a risk to a, a hospital or a caregiver, to themselves uh, that might need uh, early intervention, and we didn't realize it, but they can find the signs and say, wait a minute, this patient is exhibiting all the signs of a patient who will not adhere to the drug regimen they've been prescribed. And then robotics are being used in the, both for surgery as well as to assist elderly patients. So some examples uh, of, of, of now, these are all research university results, but in areas of depression, skin cancer, eye conditions, brain hemorrhaging, AI is being used uh, and works as well as trained physicians. The real magic is when you combine a trained physician and an AI, then, you, then your accuracy level goes up way into the 90s. There's a problem with some of this. If you look at all of these, these are done by the world's leading hospitals and research organizations. What does that mean? The data is beautifully curated. It's highly accurate data. This is not the real world. Uh, the real world is messy. But in terms of when you can control for data and you can control for experimentation, the results we've seen have been pretty dramatic. And, and this is probably, I could have expanded this list with three, four, five more pages. As a result of the early work in, in AI, we're seeing a tremendous growth in, in funding. Um, there have been over 400 companies receiving their first, uh, their first financing since 2016. 34 billion will be spent on AI and healthcare in the next two years, and the market is growing at more than 50% a year, driven number one by Asia. We have a problem of not enough physicians, major rural communities underserved, so they're investing a tremendous amount in AI to begin to bring remote uh, diagnostics, remote telemedicine, remote reading of, of, of charts, remote reading of images uh, to populations across Asia. But you can see the dramatic increase in AI funding uh, in the United States, but it's just as big globally. Some interesting projects. Um, a radiology assistant has been approved by the FDA. Uh, Medtronic uh, has been approved for a a diabetes management system that's, in, that's been fully automated in London. Uh, there have been uh, there have been something on the order of half a million people who've been screened and automatically diagnosed by a company called Babylon. Here in Armenia, uh, there's a company called Silex. Anybody from Silex in the room? 
uh, done tr very interesting work on trying to create electronic medical records for entire populations uh, in, uh, in Armenia and in Kazakhstan, and then using that data and some rule-based logic uh, to begin to do some automatic diagnostic to train physicians in diagnostic techniques. So uh, but, uh, keep an eye on Silex, they're at the forefront of, of these trends. Uh, Catalia Health has the robot in the top corner that is able to calm elderly patients and help take their vital signs, get basic health information uh, in, a, in a less threatening uh, and, and less intimidating way, uh, and attuned to the unique problems of communicating with elderly patients who don't hear well, who may be slower to react, um, and, and, and might be a, a, a bit more resistant. The world uh, is emerging in a new AI electronic medical record centered way. This is a vision of the future uh, that people like the physician Eric Topol and others are predicting will happen over the course of the next data, the next, the next decade. But the Center of Life is an is a, is a electronic medical record that is fed across the chain of providers that you see, consistent, coherent. Um, that medical record, uh, it, it serves as the intake when you're admitted to a hospital. It helps with patient screening, helps with triage, triage, all the way through uh, the progression of your progression through the healthcare system, including your eligibility for clinical trials, transcriptions of medical records, all the way through post-discharge treatment via care plans on your cell phone, uh, via automatic monitoring of, uh, of your adherence to things like drugs, and the use of robotics as patient assistance. What this is leading to, again, this is not near term, this is a, a tenure forecast, but faster diagnosis, a single view of the patient across all the providers, uh, higher clinical trials completion rates, uh, clinical trials have a very, very low completion rate as patients drop out. We can do a much better job of predicting who we live into the trials in the first place. Population data mining of the sort that Silex wants to do uh, to look at populations as a whole, uh, all the way through predictive analytics to uh, improve wellness and compliance outcomes. One of my favorite experiments is from a company called Gomard. Um, and uh, they have a, a, a product in the market called Pediatric Howl. Pediatric Howl is a baby. It's a robotic baby. The baby cries, it sits up, it reacts to commands. You can take its blood, you can take its blood sugar. It dies, you can use a defibrillator to, uh, to revive the baby. It expresses emotion, it expresses pain, it makes heart and lung sounds. So this is being used for medical education as kind of simulation is being used for medical education uh, primarily for nursing staff. But it gives you a sense as to what the future is going to look like. The one thing it does not do, luckily, is emit body odors. But in virtually uh, every other case, it, it does simulate to some degree the behavior of, of a three or four year old child. You can attach patient, you have monitors to it, and, and to, it even sleeps. So the bottom line in healthcare, $300 billion in savings in the US of population health forecasting of the sort that Silex is planning on doing. Uh, $3 billion in savings from preventative care in the UK. Uh, this is what McKinsey says the world's going to look like. 30 to 50 percent improvement in nurse productivity. And the bottom line is as much as one to one of the third years of increased life expectancy once this technology gets fully rolled out over the next decade. But we have problems. And uh, for those of you who care about data science, uh, this, is, this should be a forefront problem. The first is, there is a very tight regulatory regime controlling the use of software in healthcare. Anything that, that touches a patient uh, needs to be validated often by uh, the, the, the US uh, authorities. So on the one hand, you have tightly controlled validation of health software but what the market wants is AI to keep evolving, that keep learning every time they diagnose something that goes back in the database. So these two principles are fighting each other, and the US Food and Drug Administration is about to issue regulatory guidance for how you can have both a securely evaluated AI and one that changes over time. More importantly is data accuracy. The experiments I have talked about have all been with heavily curated data. 
great data scientists, really making sure that that data is accurate, manageable, uh, that the data had a good source, that there was the data is not corrupted. That is not the situation with most medical data. It has been estimated that as much as 70% of data in a medical record came from somewhere else. You have no idea if it's clean, if it's dirty, if the physician was paying attention. There's no way to validate that data. So we have an issue um, around healthcare data standards. The big data, the data science program here uh, at AUA, uh, I would hope would, would look at in the bioinformatics program ways of improving the quality of the basic data that feeds our models. You know, the, the first rule of computing is garbage in, garbage out. So if the data isn't good to begin with, how good are the predictions, the diagnoses made with that data? This is a, this is a problem that's going to confront the commercialization of AI in healthcare. Real estate. Uh, the normal transactions of renting an apartment, buying a house, uh, are now uh, in places like the UK and the US heavily involved with artificial intelligence, used to match buyers with the right properties. If you're an investor, which house do I want to invest in in this neighborhood? Which is going to have the highest appreciation value? Uh, how has this been selling? I want to bid on a house. Help me make a more accurate bid. Review the contracts. Review the legal documents to find anomalies and problems. Mortgages are underwritten now increasingly by AI, able to predict who is going to be a somebody who's going to likely pay these things back. So among the companies doing interesting things, we have virtual agents replacing your real estate agent with a bot. And we also have analytics tools to help you invest or buy properties better, which houses will appreciate, uh, which rent, which multi-tenant house, uh, uh, which many tenant apartments are going to have the highest rate of, 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 of tenants paying their bills and so forth. There was an experiment then in Denver, Colorado uh, about a year ago. Uh, where uh, a bot was created uh, with the goal of saying, okay, this client like this house based only on a picture. Which other houses currently for sale in Denver is this uh, potential buyer going to like? So they compared the results of three real estate agents, extra real estate agents with a bot. And the bot made predictions and the real estate agents made predictions. And in every case, the bot beat the agent. Only problem is we had no idea why. Of all the all the AIs were shown was a picture. And you had to interpret from the picture what the buyer's preference was. But again, this is one case uh, I'm going to be mentioning others where the bots did a very, very good job. Digital lawyers um, were using, uh, using AI across the law. Uh, everything from managing conflict of interest to <coughs> documents to predicting the settlement value of cases. So you've all heard the Shakespeare comment, first, kill old lawyers. Well, that's being replaced by replace them with bots. So there is a famous chatbot called Do Not Pay that has overturned over $10 million in traffic fines by having the bot fight with the local court. And uh, 375,000 tickets were overturned by this bot. Uh, 1,000 new bots were launched by the author last year in landlord-tenant disputes, in immigration disputes, and all of this was done by a 15-year-old. A 15-year-old armed with a computer and some good AI tools. Uh, and he's, uh, he has uh, already made the United Kingdom poorer by over $10 million by what he's done. He's now a uh, junior at Stanford University. Lots of activity around digital lawyers for contract analytics, for predicting uh, case outcomes, here in Armenia, there's a company called Zero, uh, which is able to scan email sent to lawyers. Here, what, what should I focus on? Uh, which, which of these uh, emails impacts the case? Which emails should I jump on right now? What do I send my assistant? What do I archive as part of a case system? So you can get a sense that uh, the work of, of lawyers worldwide is being automated. It's, it's estimated that something like two-thirds of the manual work of the law is already being automated. Uh, my daughter is a lawyer, and uh, uh, and I was explaining this for her. She said, Dad, faster, faster, faster. By the way, please automate me, too. <laughs> so, uh, you all know what a non-disclosure agreement is? 
this is an agreement that, that uh, if, you're, if you're with a company and you're bringing somebody in to see a new product, you'll have them sign a document that says, I will not share this information with anybody outside the company. It's called an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. So a firm created a bot to scan non-disclosure agreements and see the errors, see what was missing. Uh, and the uh, lawyers on average uh, for um, uh, a, a set of documents took on an average an hour and a half uh, to review these documents and they found 85% of the errors. The bot uh, did this in 26 seconds. Same thing, with much higher accuracy. And if you look at what lawyers bill, my estimate is, is that the cost of using the bot was $3.80. The cost of using the lawyers in the United States just to look at six non-disclosure agreements would have been about $4,000. So dramatic improvement of doing normal human stuff. Data engineering. If machine learning is going to continue to explode, uh, we need, it's all fueled by data. You need millions or tens of millions of impressions, whether it's images or sounds or documents. You need millions and millions and millions of pieces of data. Uh, we need collaboration across companies to help provide this data uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot larger than a single company can provide. We need data engineers to curate and manage this data. We need data scientists to build the models to analyze these data. And we even need AI familiar lawyers um, because we're about to see a whole era of litigation about the, the use and misuse of AI in human situations like healthcare. Just one example, in the automotive industry, um, many, many, many automotive insurers are sharing data um, on everything from driver behavior to accidents to road safety to create a vast big data world that no single company can provide. So there are major consortia and data service bureaus to provide billions of data objects that insurers can use. How do we know how to insure autonomous cars? We need to find out, if, if I have an autonomous car, what kind of insurance rate should I pay? And to do that, we need to understand, are autonomous cars safer or less safe than normal cars? So on average today, there's about one fatality for every 100 million miles driven. So we need to instrument autonomous cars the same way. What this means is we need 8.8 .8 billion miles of driving data just to predict are we going to be plus or minus 20 deaths around that one death. So that's not good enough for insurance. To do that, we would have had to start collecting data around the time that Shakespeare lived. If we have a fleet of 100 vehicles operating 24 hours a day, if Shakespeare had started instrumenting, then we have enough data. But that's not good enough. We want a hundred billion miles to understand uh, plus or minus five deaths. And that means the Sumerians and the Babylonians would have had to have start collecting driving data to feed our models today. So we have massive data shortage problems in solving some of the biggest problems. I'm going to look at some of the solutions. We need to enable, to enable the new world we're, we're going to be living in, we need um, a, a massive number of data scientists. IBM uh, estimates that we're going to need uh, about 61,000 data scientists, the people who build the models. But for every data scientist, we need 10 data engineers to curate, manage, create that data. So we have huge amounts of, of, of a shortfall of, in, uh, in our data sciences. That's why the program here at AUA is so important. Training data scientists is one of the biggest growth areas, and I'm delighted that AUA is stepping up in the leadership role here. If you look at Canada all by itself, Canada as a whole, the whole country, is producing one-tenth the number of data scientists they need in the city of Toronto alone. So big, big, big shortages for, for real data people. If you, uh, if you ask IT people in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe what is the biggest skill gap they have that companies are afraid of, in Western Europe, 42% of IT people said it's data science. In Eastern Europe, 41%. So again, the surveys, the demand from the market itself is suggesting we have big problems. 
but their help is on the way. We have new investment areas, of, uh, some of which are active here as well. Data, data engineering tools help us clean the data using better technology. I mentioned the importance of data labeling. So you need to label all of these images and objects. This is a cat, this is a dog, this is a car. Uh, there are a number of companies that have stepped up in leadership roles around the, around the, the data labeling, and, and one of them uh, one of them is uh, is is, is uh, it's super annotate AI right here in Yerevan um, that is has great tools and it also offers data labeling as a service. Uh, there are data exchanges where companies can sell the data they're not using or share it. Uh, you can crowdsource data via companies like Cagle and say, I need a million impressions uh, for the project I'm running. Can you please crowdsource them for me? Can you define ways of getting me that data? Uh, and then you've got uh, whole towns, as I mentioned, in Africa, where, where people are devoted, hundreds of people doing nothing but data labeling eight hours a day. So these are all investable areas. They're all interesting if you're interested in forming a company or joining a company. These are hot areas because we need data um, and we have massive data shortage. Insight as a service. If you look at the history of computing, we have gone from algorithms to tools to platforms to solutions that actually help people and then to consulting firms who say, forget all of that. You don't want to hire programmers. You don't want to build models. We'll do that and then we'll tell you what to do with those results. So uh, this, new, this new thing is called Insight as a Service, and it's particularly appropriate for consulting firms. AI is now demanded by everywhere. We have data science shortage. We can't find enough data. So let me go to a consultant who manages all of these things for me. And I don't care uh, about the methodology. All I want to know is what do, what do I do to make my company run better? So we've got data as a service. We've got analytics as a service, helping analyze the data. That's what we were last year. And now, insight as a service. Tell me how to improve my business using data, but I don't want to know how you got there. So um, one of the projects I've been involved with, um, insight as a service, uh, is using big data in an oil field, looking at 40,000 oil wells to say, what, is, what, what do I do to manage my oil wells better? How do I twist the knobs and gears? to improve my production. And the company, uh, E-Links, uh, manages 40,000 oil wells and then uses that data for its customers, like Shell Oil, to figure out how to better manage production. And they build a digital twin model using state-of-the-art data science to monitor what an oil well looks like. They have data scientists then evaluating the results of these models and then instrumenting these models at client sites. The clients are not building the models, this company is, and they're providing the insight. Turn this valve to the left. And what they managed to do is using big data to increase production by 6%, which is, in oil and gas, enormous. They're also able to cut down the use of hazardous chemicals uh, by applying these big data models. But again, what this company does is say, why don't you subscribe to your oil well? We'll manage all the data, and we'll tell you what to do. Well, you just subscribe to the oil well. Don't worry about managing the massive data flow. So let's look at where AI is going and some risks. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a failed slide. Lots of issues with, with, with uh, we have yet to, to fix. Data bias. The data is typically biased around healthy Caucasian males which really does hurt our ability to use models in healthcare. Um, IBM did such a bad job of cancer diagnostics, they canceled the project. Uh, we've seen uh, Facebook had a big issue last year, you may have read about it, where Facebook had an AI, uh, uh, two AIs suddenly were created that started talking to each other uh, in a language that Facebook did not understand and they felt that the AIs were duplicating themselves, replicating themselves, they had no idea what was happening. So Facebook shut down the project uh, out of fear. Apple was sued for a billion dollars last year uh, because its facial recognition technology uh, led to someone's arrest. Uh, a, uh, a house was raided. Uh, lots of police showed up at a house uh, that uh, they thought there was wild activity going on uh, uh, and they thought there might be a crime being committed. What was happening was 
the Amazon Echo, an Amazon speaker, turned itself up to maximum volume automatically uh, and caused a neighbor to say, what the heck is going on? A six-year-old girl called Amazon Alexa uh, with no controls and ordered herself a $170 uh, dollhouse. Uh, and so you, we, can, we can list over and over and over again the problems with AI. It's not all great stuff. And a hedge fund went bankrupt uh, using AI to predict great investments. Uh, one, one company said, we need some new color, names for brand new colors. And here are some of the names for some of the colors that the AI came up with. Um, sand Dan, Grade Bat, uh, Grass Bat, Cindus Poop. Dope. Uh, so again, we, 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 we need a little bit of work here. Uh, so some good news on the AI front. I think you'll all applaud this. <laughs> so again, I wanted to share the good news with you. So what's next? Um, well, what are the areas that we still have a lot of work to do? One is the search for artificial general intelligence. We now can do some pretty interesting things like predicting which house a buyer might buy. But we can't, there's no general AI that operates in the world for any problem. All of our problems today are vertically specific. So there's the search for automa automatic general intelligence, artificial general intelligence that operates the way we do in any unforeseen human situation. This is a science fiction fantasy. It's not going to happen anytime soon. We have no theory about AI. A AI is all applied. It's all experimental. There is no general theory of how all of these bits of AI should fit together. I've mentioned that deep learning has models that are thousands of layers thick. The new technology coming called quantum computing, which there's also early AI experiments, will allow us to have models that are millions of layers thick and operate in a fraction of a second. But again, deep learning is, is now uh, up for some level of criticism. The cracks in the edifice is biased. We can't reproduce results. It's all experimental. There's no scientific discipline around AI. And the AI practitioners are restless. So we have people saying, guess what's going to happen? We're probably going to have another AI winter. If your company does not have Google's research budget, PhD talent, and massive data, you're not going to get very, very good results. And that's what one expert says. Another expert is, is predicting AI winter is like predicting the stock market crash. You will have seen it coming in retrospect, but you will not be able to predict it. But because the hype is so high right now, you know, as Sundar Pichai says, AI is the new fire. Um, there's bound to be uh, some deflation in expectations. So what's next? Beware what I call the crapware invasion, where everything is called AI. So the House of Lords in the United Kingdom did a study on the United Kingdom's readiness for artificial intelligence. Uh, and the, the bottom line was, we'll just quote one thing, 40% of companies saying they were AI companies had no AI in their product. None. So buyer beware. When I evaluate business opportunities, um, I, I, I look at, at five dimensions. Do I like the business model? Am I excited by the opportunity emotionally? Uh, are the deal terms appropriate? Are the risks acceptable, like management risk and market risk? And can I confirm what you've told me by due diligence? So, I applied this kind of a screen when I'm investing in, in AI. I'm not going to go any more into this, but uh, uh, just to make a few closing comments. The 2019 is not like in the, the Wild West, the new world of 2012. Consumers are more sophisticated about AI. Investors are more sophisticated. Uh, we've already had the wave of tools. We're now moving to deployed solutions, vertical business problems. As Kai-Fu Lee, uh, the leader of the largest investment fund in China and the former head of, uh, of Google's AI program says, we're moving from experimentation to deployment. And that's where the opportunities for new companies are, like Silex, on deploying real solutions, solving problems, not creating theoretical models. So we're at the top of the AI hype cycle right now. 
MIT did a study, and they said that basically two-thirds of all companies today are marketing themselves as AI companies. So AI is, is everywhere. In terms of ecosystems, where is the real energy? The top ecosystems for AI, Silicon Valley, Beijing, Tel Aviv, Boston, uh, and London. Why? Because of the availability of funding, the number of companies, but most important, the talent pool. Uh, I'm, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about things I think if you would like to build more of a, a more robust AI presence here in Armenia, I've got some suggestions. So if you want to build a big data ecosystem, focus on solving business problems. Marry your data scientists with people of good knowledge of vertical markets and areas here in Armenia that are right for the use of AI agriculture. This has become a very big deal of, of marketing for tourism. The major tourist industry here, you could be doing a, you know, a significant job ma marrying AI uh, to the tourist industry or to water management or to defense and logistics. These are just some ideas, but focus on doing some practical things for real people who are able to pay you. University industry partnerships are essential. Uh, in the US, all of the major breakthroughs have come to some degree by this kind of collaboration, often involves stealing people from universities, but there's usually a university involved to some degree in the major developments of AI in the US uh, and in Europe. You need to support your companies. On average, in the US and Western Europe, the average AI company that is successful and gets acquired or does a public offering has to raise $27 million before they exit. So it's not just the first $50,000 or $100,000. You need funding um, and may come locally in Armenia from the diaspora, from the EU. You need funding to keep these companies going and growing. You need to think about the life cycle of, of, of big data and AI, not just startups. What do you need to support companies uh, as they go from being local to regional, to reaching out to Georgia, for example, um, or parts of Russia, and then parts of Western Europe or the US? They're going to need talent. They're going to need staff. They're going to need trained executives. How do you do that uh, in, in a responsible way? And then you have lots going on here in Yerevan. I'm blown away by how much AI activity there is. But it's hard to find anybody who knows where all the pieces are. Um, I've, I've talked to 10 people, and each of them has come, helped me put together a picture of AI, because there is so much going on, um, but it's very, very, very diffuse. So more coordination would be helpful. In Silicon Valley uh, is a great example of, of the three things you need to build an AI ecosystem. You need infrastructure. Uh, you need attorneys. You need uh, somebody to fund this. Uh, you need accounting firms, uh, and, and you need uh, some way uh, for companies to get better known. You need IP and talent, um, incubators, accelerators. You have great universities here. You do have some incubators here. Uh, but you need more of that. You need the press to be able to publicize your success. That means a smarter press understands what AI is all about. And then you need capital. You need early capital um, from groups like SmartGate. You need more mature capital to help grow those companies. Um, and uh, over time, you want corporate partnerships uh, with folks like uh, Synopsys and Venture Graphics uh, to help fund the growth of, of your AI companies. So you've got a great start. Um, I am blown away by the kind of work that you're doing. This is, these are uh, some of the more interesting AI companies in, right here in, in, in Armenia or that have major Armenian presence. If I have overlooked a company that's in favor of yours, I apologize, but, but uh, I wanted to get a sense as to what's happening here. You've got Cognes that is able to take financial documents uh, and make them auditable, understandable, and usable across the financial life cycle. You've got Disperse, which is using computer vision to figure out how, where are we in a construction project. This is absolutely state of the art. You've got two hertz able to uh, do uh, voice analytics to make things clearer for people who are hard of hearing like me. Get rid of background noise, amplify signals. And Talonair, run by a good friend, Al Ozian. If you ever had an opportunity to hear Al speak, run and do it. He's an incredible motivational speaker. He has got a combination of AI, <coughs> image analysis, and, uh, and drones and robotics to figure out the health of crops. Uh, he's doing this around the world. 
uh, I mentioned zero before uh, that's taking a leadership position and using machine learning to understand email um, and to help uh, a, a lawyer um, optimize their day. Super annotate, uh, image labeling, uh, again, at the forefront of solving one of the biggest problems in artificial intelligence. Smart click uh, is doing predictive analytics, looking at consumer behavior uh, inside of stores on, on, on you know, online shopping systems to figure out what the, what the consumer wants, what they'll do next. I mentioned silence before, at both at the level of national health as well as the level of using uh, diagnostics to educate medical professionals. Uh, two interesting consulting firms, uh, Development Do um, and NMX Global, both uh, help other companies solve problems using their own big data tools, their analytics, and their teams uh, to create AI applications for those who don't want to build them. That's uh, just a, a hint of what's happening here. I think the new program in data science is going to lead to an explosion of more of this. So in thinking about AI as I wrap up, in terms of looking at what's attractive, in terms of your ability to evaluate companies that you might want to work for, or start, or invest in, is the product cutting edge? Uh, is it reheated business intelligence? Is it state-of-the-art deep learning? Is it state-of-the-art rule-based learning? Design, is there a vertical market partner you're working with, a real company you're working with to understand requirements? Are you solving real problems, or is this a science project? Remember that mainstream, company, mainstream customers in real markets solve problems. Is, are you solving a problem, or are you developing technology that's going to be used by a few experimenters? Can you explain what your AI is doing? Where are you going to get your data from to power machine learning? Where are you going to get your capital from? Uh, when you want to exit, doesn't Google or Amazon or Facebook really have something like this or not? Because that's probably going to be one exit path. And the most important is, do you have state-of-the-art outcomes? Are your outcomes better than the other AIs? So conclusion, uh, AI in 2019 is different than 2012. Tons of opportunities for innovation. We're moving, though, from tools to vertical markets. So think about business solutions. Remember that we already have nearly 7,000 companies active. Remember that many investors have already made their bets. And remember that the competition isn't just coming uh, from your company, it's coming from big companies as well. Early adopters buy tools, mainstream buyers solve problems. So somebody on your team needs to know a vertical market in their bones. Build use cases, validate results by partnering with customers. And then the ultimate question, does your company demonstrate better outcomes than the other guys? So thank you. Um, I hope this has been some helpful in framing what's happening with AI. And I'd be glad to take some questions in the time remaining. How many of you are involved in an AI project, class, company? Okay. How many of those are companies, AI companies? How many of you have companies I did not mention in this part? That's great because I now I can learn something. How many of you um, are, are finding some obstacles in your path? to working with AI? And if so, what are those obstacles? Things are going great? That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for delivering this fascinating uh, speech. And I'm representing Silex that was cited several times in a speech. And yes, we're also working on our AI solution. And when we talk about the obstacle, the major obstacle is the data. Of course, when you have to train your models, you need a good quality data. Like we're in the healthcare sector, like we're, our company is also a national operator here in Armenia and also in Kazakhstan. And we're also delivering technologies in Kazakhstan. We're expecting at some point of time we will have the data in these two countries, but 
And we're developing now the AI, and I believe this is the obstacle for everybody. You need to find a good quality data in order you can train your models. And this should be the number one obstacle, I believe, for the all who are working on the AI domain. So there are data exchanges um, where companies are contributing, we're selling their data. There are public domain data sources. Um, and it would be great uh, for regional data here uh, if people would start combining or creating some kind of online directory of the public data sources that do exist, maybe government data, maybe company data. Um, but you need to figure out what the assets are. Uh, and these, these directories are increasingly common in the US. And I think you're exactly right. You need to do it regionally. Uh, because if, if you think that you know, Armenia has 3 million people, and we need you know, millions of, of objects to, uh, to power our systems, uh, that regional cooperation would be helpful. Again, that's why China is such a threat. Because China has bazillions of people. Uh, uh, and China, mo China monitors people's behavior absurdly and dangerously, but they have data. And, uh, and that's why they say they're going to beat the rest of us, because they have this vast data store. So your point is extremely well taken. Um, one of the messages that, that, that I've been hearing all week from the various people I've been talking to is the need, is there's one word that's impressed on my head is collaborate. That you need to collaborate wherever possible between institutions, um, with, with, you know, with, 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 well, with industry, um, with normal people. You need to start collaborating, sharing, building shared repositories would be a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may, uh, that was actually part uh, of uh, the issue that I wanted to raise, which, which is a very important uh, question, and thank you uh, for your answer. Um, another part of my question is more, if you wish, philosophical. Uh, as the adoption uh, of AI increases uh, in our society, uh, well, all of us know uh, that our society is now governed uh, in a, to a large extent by our biases. You were talking a little uh, a bit earlier uh, about AI biases, but we have our biases right now. So uh, how do you see reconciling these two, or will our society completely change uh, because of these new biases? That's... That, that's that is a question on the top of many people's agenda right now. It is now common that many AI conferences will have an ethics component. And um, all I can say is if we get ahead of AI and start infusing our AI with ethical concerns, we'll have better outcomes. Um, but I'm not very optimistic. May I? Uh, Please. Uh, you know, there is a danger that we, if we start to impose our ethical concerns on the AI, we will impose our current biases on it. So uh, then we will get nowhere. Well, the, the, the best way to avoid that is to have better data. Mm -hmm. um, so now in the, in the areas that you mentioned, like healthcare, we have stopped simply looking at, at the dominant demographic mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. We're now trying to expand our data to include you know, many, many different populations so we can get away from that kind of, of data-oriented bias. Mm -hmm. So the first defense is great data. And ensuring and, and asking 19 times of anybody building an AI that might affect you, where did your data come from? Is it truly representative? Uh, we even have data labeling problems. That, um, that the people who label data are going to have their own biases and what's important and what's not. So we're all human beings, but again, ask questions, validate, do your diligence on the data that's powering these AIs. And if you're in the if you're an organization that is responsible for curating data, then you have a real moral responsibility to make sure that data is as unbiased as it can be, including the people who label it, the people who curate it, the people who define it. So again, there's no simple solution here. 
Um, technology is always about to ruin our lives. And that, that's back in the era of the printing press. People criticized Gutenberg. When anybody can read the Bible, anybody will have their own interpretation and society will fall apart. Uh, so we, we, but we've managed I've, we've managed to survive. We've managed to get through this. But people be aware of the risks and the dangers and address them when you can. Great question. Um, you raised uh, ethical, one should be worried about ethical considerations, and you're not entirely optimistic. Uh, and, and, and I was going to ask a question that when you get access to, to a free artificial intelligence software that you put your data in from Google. Does Google harvest your data as part of their uh, agreement? Is that where they get their money? And, and the reason that I raise the question is that it feels to me as an older, much older person than many of the young people here, that privacy to me is more of a concern than it would appear to be in younger people. Maybe that's an inaccurate observation. But a lot of these big data and so forth is giving away access to things that come back to society in a way that may, you may not actually like. You may, in other words, if you can predict what an audience is going to buy or you can advertise selectively, you start to change people's behaviors based on this data and they don't know it. And, and so it feels like how privacy is managed, how the risk of harming somebody who's giving you something in good faith and doesn't realize that they can't worry about this topic. But ethicists can, industry leaders can, so then I just, you know, wonder what your view is of somebody looking after those problems for us. You are, Larry, you're exactly correct. Um, how many of you read, how many of you know what the term E-U-L-A means? This is something you, you confront every day. What does E-U-L-A mean? End user license agreement. End user license agreement. It comes with every piece of software you buy. And we all don't read it, and we all likely skip through it and check by. I never read one. That but end user license agreement typically says what the company is going to do to you. And there's an old saying in Silicon Valley. If you're paying for a free product, if you're not paying for a free product like Facebook, and you, you wonder what's going on, you are the problem. Yeah. So what is Facebook's business model? They give us all these free stuff, then they watch us, they track our behavior, and then they use that to manipulate us, or they sell that data to somebody else. So we have become the product. Um, if you, uh, there are some, right now the United States Congress is thinking of some rules against this. They're not uh, demanding that, uh, that the big tech companies not sell us as the product, without our explicit permission, not buried in 4,000 you know, words of legal junk. Um, so there's a reaction against this, but be an informed consumer. Do I have great hopes that this is not gonna happen? No, look what's happening in China. How many know what the social credit score is? Social credit score. What is the social credit score? Yeah, they are monitoring their They are making evaluation So China is tracking every kind of behavior. How many times you were spotted, literally, how many times you were spotted jaywalking across the street? Uh, uh, how many times you, know, you, you have been to certain kinds of meetings? What kinds of things do you subscribe to? And they're giving you a score, which is really a political reliability score. And some people are not allowed to travel outside the country. Some people are being denied jobs based on this social credit score because the Chinese are collecting data on every aspect of your behavior. Think of all the things that Google alone knows about you. Are you aware of what Google knows about you? Google knows who your friends are, who your family is. Google can understand what's your religion. They understand who your kids are, where your kids go to school, where you bank. These are all the things that Google knows about you just because every time you send an email or buy something, 
Google is scraping all of this information. But magic has happened to get into the wrong hands. So there's big concern now in France and in the EU and in the US about how do we deal with this? <coughs> we need to get ahead of this potentially by some regulation without killing the process. So um, we are very early in this process, but be aware of the dangers and keep asking these questions. I don't have a simple answer, Larry, but I do know that, uh, that the minute we forfeit our rights by clicking the box on the end user license agreement, uh, now in, part, in terms of younger, younger people are more willing to do permission-based marketing than older people. Uh, some people say, hey, I'm being monitored anyway, I, I can't stop it, I might as well go along with it. Because the value of what I'm getting outweighs the potential risk to me. So we all make our individual calculations. I've given up years ago myself. I just clicked the box. What do you think about the integration of AI nanotechnology, creating such a nanotechnology technology based on nanotechnology, not creating nanotechnology as a service, so for ready to along in this life? Um, uh, I think it's already happening. I think it's already happening, particularly in the area of sensor technology. That's 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 going on right now. So um, I think nano and quantum um, are, are going to usher in a whole new generation of AI. So I've been talking a lot about about AI and deep learning and, uh, and big data, and you run, you run the data science project here. Would you like to make any comments? I think that uh, the presentation was very informative, so we have some comments. Are there issues that this group has come up with that you plan on addressing um, as, as an administrator, as a teacher? Well, as a center teacher, we think that uh, our students need to get uh, a little more uh, understanding and more knowledge and skills on the side of how to define the business problem and how to be able to communicate in the right way with the business owners to be able to communicate the exact message that they need. So, uh, in our view, the discussion is just uh, about IP uh, coding. It's more than to be about so let me make a personal comment. Uh, that, that's that's a, I think a great way for us to, to wrap things up today. I had seven careers in my life. I started life as a professor focusing on the Italian Renaissance um, and uh, on, on medieval Christianity. And that was what I was doing for many years. Um, and I ended my life in venture capital and AI and things like this. Um, but what, I, what I've learned is that, is that the old humanities that we tend to say, oh, that's, that's done, that's not interesting. The humanistic skills of communication, of engagement with people, understanding people's motivations, understanding how effectively to work with them, those are soft humanity skills. And I think there's an ongoing place, uh, even in the world of data, big data, AI, for people who can effectively communicate the old-fashioned way, uh, who can write coherent business plans and engage with customers to understand their requirements. Those are soft human skills. And I think that as we build programs around AI, big data, machine learning, we'd be able to integrate those kinds of skills as well. Because ultimately, you are serving a customer. And you can't understand that customer unless you can dialogue effectively, communicate effectively. So I think there's, there is still a, a reason uh, for the old humanities. My boss for many years was Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. And Steve's favorite thing, uh, we used to have a picture of this at, at, uh, at one of our companies, was, was the intersection of science and the humanities. Uh, so just keep that in mind, that, there, that you need to be effective listeners and communicators, as well as effective coders, designers, and data wranglers. So um, let me say thank you. Uh, you've been very attentive, great audience. If I can help anybody uh, around these issues, uh, uh, my email is weissman at gmail, and uh, these slides will be available to you. So thank so you. Thank you.